All right. Well, welcome to my last lecture with you. Um, and this one is partly about how to write about statistics and partly about any other requests you might have. Um, I'll probably record it in two separate pieces and when I put it on the website I'll put part of it here under writing about statistics and part of it here under request for specific stats so you can find it. Oh dear, I mustn't have uploaded the new thing. Oops, a day. No, that's good. So there is a handout that goes with it. It's on the website back there. Um, and what I have to say about writing statistics uh, is not um, much. All right. So this is specifically for the research proposal. I will say I talked to someone earlier today about the critical appraisal. You're not writing about statistics in your critical appraisal. You're talking about it. So it's okay to not use all of the formal language um, all the time when you talk about something. The whole purpose of a presentation is to not have to be formal. So feel free to talk about statistics um, without using this, all of these specific things. You've only got about a minute to talk about statistics in the critical appraisal, so um, you fit in what you can there. All right, so some tips about writing about statistics in the research proposal. This is my important message, putting my writing centre hat on. Um, when you're writing anything, you're telling a story. And in, in research, the story is about the questions you're trying to answer. The only reason you have statistics in there is because it helps you answer the questions. So when you're writing a research proposal, the research has questions that it is trying to answer, and the story that you're telling there is about how you're going to go about answering those questions. So having statistics in there is not there is no reason to have statistics other than to answer the questions. So every time you look at it as a whole, it shouldn't feel like the statistics is just randomly chucked in there. That's the idea. All right, that goes for papers that are written too. Statistics often feels like it's randomly chucked in a paper and that's the way they do it. The only reason to have it there is to help answer the questions they're trying to answer. So that's why it's so useful to focus on what question they're trying to answer and that helps you to decide what statistics goes with what. Anyway, so here's a general rule of thumb. A person reading your writing, uh, reading your writing about statistics, should have a rough idea of what the questions are just by reading the section on statistics. Okay? Right. That's for a research proposal. For a written article, it's a little trickier, uh, depending on what the rules are for the journal that you're writing for. Uh, but in a research proposal, a person should be able to read just the statistics section and tell what questions you are trying to answer. So here's some details. There are three main parts of a research proposal where you will find statistical information. Um, they are in the, whichever part you talk about how you chose the subjects, whichever part you talk about data collection, and whichever part you talk about data analysis. Some, you know, your research proposal has specific sections for those things, um, but in other settings, if you're writing a grant, they might be lumped into other sections. So the subjects and the data collection are often mentioned in the methods section and not in the data analysis section. So just because it's not under data analysis doesn't mean that there's not statistical information. All right. So remember this. This is like how to choose what stats goes with what. All the information that goes into you choosing what stats went with what has to be there somewhere so that the person reading it can tell that you've made that decision based on actual information rather than just randomly picking something. So in particular, you need to mention uh, what the question is that you're referring to, um, what the variables are doing and whether there's repeated measures or not. That's what you need to mention and I've got an example. Okay, so when you talk about the subjects, you need to talk about how they'll be chosen, how many of them and how you chose what that's, how, how many of them uh, and why they will help to answer the questions. Now, the top bit and the, the top one, how they'll be chosen, and the bottom one, why they'll help to answer the questions, um, are not technically statistical questions. They're research design questions. Um, but in particular, you want to mention if things are chosen randomly, um, and you want to mention why the people you've chosen are representative of the population you're trying to discuss. Um, 
Uh, and that might not be people, it might be rats or whatever you want to, dis you want to describe why the model, like the animal model you're using is appropriate. That's a medical thing, but it has to be there somewhere and I'm just mentioning it now so that it's there. But in particular about how to choose your sample size, here is an example based on my classic Chile experiment. So um, 50 participants will be recruited to the study. A clinically important difference in temperature is considered to be 2 degrees. Lair's formula, as presented in Petrie and Save in 2012, gives us an ex a sample size of at least 50 in order to have 80% power of detecting this difference at the 5% level of significance. This is based on a standard deviation of 7 degrees and the pair t-test C data analysis. Okay, I'm going to pull apart what I wrote there. I've said what number I need, the 50 participants. I've said what the important difference is that I'm looking for, that's the two degrees, that has to be mentioned. Okay, let me just go back. When you talk about sample size, back in the sample size lecture, there's five things you have to mention other than the sample size itself. You need to measure the difference you're looking for, which is what I've said, a clinically important difference. Often it's a good idea to explain why you think that's a clinically important difference, but sometimes you can just say it. Uh, you need to say, um, what the power is, so 80% power, that's been mentioned. You need to say what the level of significance is, 5% significance, that's been mentioned. Uh, you need to say some measure of variability. So in terms of a numerical outcome, you need to do a standard deviation, so that's my seven degrees. And you need to mention what statistical test you're using um, basing this sample size off, so I've mentioned the paired t-test. So I have mentioned all five things that are needed to describe a sample size. And that's what I need to do if I talk about sample size in a research proposal. If you have an article that you're looking at and they mention a sample size calculation at all, you can usually count the five things somewhere in that paragraph. Then of course there's the sixth thing which is what the sample size actually is and it's usually a good idea to reference how you calculated it but that's not completely necessary. If you look in most papers they don't reference a calculation at all. They just go, here it is. They say the five things you know, the power and the significance and the standard deviation, and then they just give the answer. And it's okay for you to do that too. But one of the nice things that you can do by putting in the reference to Lair's formula or to an online calculator um, is to indicate that you did something. Because part of your purpose for writing this is to prove that you know how this is done. Not always true in um, real research. But it never hurts to show off your knowledge when you're writing a research proposal. Data collection, you need to describe what will be done to the subjects, you need to describe what will be recorded and what will be calculated and why those reflect the questions. That's not really a statistics thing, that's just describing your methods. But those things should be there. Like from a statistical point of view, you have to describe those things for the statistics to make sense. In particular, if you're going to do some sort of calculation based on the numbers that you're doing, you should say so. So you're going to calculate some sort of index um, from someone else's paper or if you're going to um, add up specific scores on a questionnaire based on someone else's design of that's a reasonable way of measuring depression, you should mention that. Any calculation that you plan to do to produce the results you want other than the statistical like, t-tests and stuff should be mentioned. All right, and now the data analysis. These are the things that have to be there. The question you're trying to answer, the variables involved, the procedure you use and why you chose it, and how you know what the answer is to your question. Those four things have to be there. Now you can lump several things together. You can say for all of these things we're going to use a t-test and for all of these things we're going to use a chi-squared test. That's okay. And you'll see that in published articles. They'll say for all of the continuous variables they were compared using a t-test. And that's okay. Uh, but this information has to be around there somewhere. It's somewhere in your research proposal, preferably here in the data analysis. So here's an example of how I might say it. In order to decide if chili content has an effect on temperature after the meal, a paired t-test will be performed. This is appropriate because the crossover design gives paired data and body temperature is usually normally distributed. To investigate whether gender and age affect the relationship between chili and temperature, a mixed effects regression with age and gender as covariates will be performed. Results will be considered significant for p-values below 0.05. So let's walk through that. We were supposed to, I'm supposed to say what the questions are I'm trying to answer. Uh, decide if chili content, investigate gender and age. Excellent, they're my questions I'm trying to answer. Um, I've mentioned what statistical procedure I'm doing, the paired t-test, mixed effects regression. I've mentioned why for at least one of them. I've mentioned why I'm doing paired because of the crossover design. 
Um, and I've mentioned the normal distribution, which is usually a good thing to mention. You can also say, no, I'll mention that in a second. Um, and then I've also said right at the bottom how I'll know. I will know what my answer is based on my p-value being under 0.05. That line has to be there somewhere in your research proposal. Because you, if you have statistics at all, you need to tell the reader what your significance level is. Now, you will have set it back when you did your sample size calculation if you did one, um, but you don't, you should say it here too. Um, yeah, now if you don't feel like you've got enough space to do all of that, you can cut it down a bit. I could have probably pulled out the, this is appropriate because blah, 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 and maybe done it a little bit uh, more streamlined and said a paired t-test would be performed because um, it's paired data, and that would have cut down a couple of lines. Um, people are usually okay to only have a small amount on statistics because the assumption is that the people reading your paper know what statistics goes with what. But if you've got enough space, it's good to put it all in because you want to prove that you have thought about what stats goes with what situation. There you go. Um, but if you really look at a paper and just do everything in the paper but in future tense rather than past tense, it's usually okay. Yes? Uh, crossover design means that um, there's two groups and one group does the, the placebo and the other group goes, does the treatment and then a little bit later they switch over and the first the group that was on the placebo before becomes the treatment group after and the person that was the people that were on the treatment before become the placebo group after. So technically it's everybody gets both situations. Um, it's just that you switch over who does it what first so that you can make sure that which order they're done in isn't um, a factor involved. Yes, that's what a crossover design is. Uh, medical statistics at a glance has quite a good description of different study designs, even though that's technically a research methodology thing and not a statistics thing. Um, I like that. In the past, people, you guys have been given lectures on study design, but it may not have been a thing anymore. So, anyway. And that's pretty much all I have to say about it. Like, your statistics is not, section is not going to be groundbreaking. It's going to sound pretty much the same as everybody else's statistics section, but that's just the way it's done. Like, it's, you know, most mathematics sounds the same. Um, so statistics, if you say it wrong, it's just wrong. Um, and so there's usually only a couple of ways to say it. Grammatically, you can order your sentence a bit differently, maybe. Um, but it's going to sound really similar. And that's okay. That's just the way that this genre of writing works. And don't forget, it's all part of the story. Um, actually, everything in your research proposal should service the question you're trying to answer. You have the bit at the beginning with the literature review is supposed to, dis is supposed to convince the people reading it that your question is worthwhile answering. Um, and then at the end, yeah, the statistics is just, well, this is how we're going to answer the question. And the description of how you're going to do the study is, is making sure that the things that you're doing actually do answer the question. Everything is about the research question you're trying to answer, and it's not the worst thing to keep, don't be a broken record, but keep mentioning it. Because I hate, as a reader, having to flick back and forth between things. So uh, you don't, uh, if it's more than a page, two, more than two pages distant from where you are, it's not the worst thing to do a cut, you know, have a couple of words to remind people what we're talking about here. So instead of saying research question one, say the question of whether and actually say it. Um, because people don't have that long a memory. Imagine someone reading 200 of these to decide who gets funding. That's the person that you're thinking of. Or imagine someone having to read 100 and... You know, how many of you guys are there? There's, there's like 40 groups? No, 30 groups? How many are there? 150 of you? Divide by 30 groups. So there's about 30... You imagine someone reading all 30 of these and, and, and getting tired, so just <laughs> consider your reader. All right, there you go. Um, if you are ever worried about your, what you're said about your statistics, I mean, you shouldn't be, it will be fine. Okay, so that's my first thing. But if you ever are worried, um, feel free to just send me a quick email um, and I'll tell you if it sounds right. I will not be able to tell you without more information whether it matches with what you're trying to do, but I can tell you whether grammatically you've used the right things that go with statistical words in certain places. So 
uh, I'll tell you, no, you can't say non-parametric data, take that out. Um, so that's the sort of thing I can do, um, and it's much quicker than doing a meeting, um, so feel free. Um, and that's only for you guys who are here, I'll recognize, if any of you who aren't here, I'll recognize you. <laughs> no, I won't, not if you don't put, <laughs> but um, I will feel grumpy. I have felt grumpy recently about some of that. Uh, yeah, I should say it on the video. It's really disconcerting to have people walk in after your lecture, having chosen there, therefore not to go to your lecture and to go to the one after. That's very sad for a lecturer. So thank you to all of you who are here. Mm -hmm. Those of you who are listening, I'm very grumpy at you. <laughs> okay. Sorry? 